You put the transducer on the abdomen and within a second, you know that the baby is dead. How, how, how do you break those news? When I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, the first thing I did is I went, I went to the internet to find out that I would die within two years. Okay. And I called my friend, the professor of hematology, and he said, it's all rubbish keepers. Uh, come and see me tomorrow. <laughs> to be honest with the patients, to laugh with the patients, to, to feel really sad with the patients, to feel part of what you were telling them. And that is what came across in the film. That I care about them because I do care about people. I cannot be a detached professional being afraid that if I show feelings, I may be misunderstood. If I am misunderstood, well, so be it. The following podcast is with Professor Kipros Nikolaidis, a Greek Cypriot fetal medicine expert who is acknowledged globally as one of the pioneers of fetal medicine. He is the founder and chairman of the Fetal Medicine Foundation and the Fetal Medicine Center in London. His expertise in fetal diagnostics, intervention, and surgery development are recognized worldwide. In fact, Professor Kipros Nikolaidis even stars in the Netflix documentary Surgeon's Cut, which I do advise for you to watch. We start this podcast by talking about his ethos when communicating with patients, his inspiration behind this, which was his father. Then we move on to his motivation behind becoming a fetal medicine consultant. We also talk about how he was able to innovate and then implement his science, because as in his own words, these are two different things. Innovation, which is the science, and then you got politics, which is the implementation of the science. It's not often that you find role models such as Professor Nicolaidis, and it's important that we listen and we learn from them. I hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you, Professor, for doing this with us today. It's a true, it's a true honor and a pleasure to have you. It's my pleasure. Um, we came here earlier and uh, we, it, we got to see the awe-inspiring building of Fetal Medicine Institute. And I think one thing I, that I can definitely say is it doesn't look like a hospital. I don't like hospitals. I don't like doctors. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, the last uh, few years I had to be a patient and then that reinforced my dislike of hospitals and doctors. My dream always was that I should create a, 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 a museum or an art gallery. So I think that the vast majority of women have a normal pregnancy and pregnancy is a normal event and women should not be seen in hospitals. Pregnancy is not a disease. It's a, it's a, it's a very important part of the life of somebody that should be celebrated. I asked over the years the hospital administration to create such a center and of course they always refused. But then through my own uh, charity organization I developed this center as I always dreamt it to be a, a, a great center, a museum, an art gallery where people would feel great when they arrive. Um, and for the few that come with problems, as soon as they enter the, the, the place, they, they already feel much better. So this is the center. I think it does play a big role in someone's journey. Of course, the environment plays a big, big role. Um, and I don't only think for the patients, as well for the doctors as well. I don't know if you agree well, with that. Over the years, again, I have been giving a lot of scholarships to doctors from many different countries. I give about 80 scholarships to people from all over the world. My vision always was that when we do research and we have new discoveries, those discoveries are meaningful only if they can benefit people from all over the world. Uh, rather than remain in the hands of the inventors so they can make money out of it or become important. So I've always been giving scholarships to people from all over the, the world with that aim. And again, if you look at the doctors that work here, they look different from the ones that work in other hospitals. They are nicely dressed, they feel happy, <laughs> they, they look happy. And, uh, and, and that is part of the overall attitude that I have uh, in terms of how we look after people. Uh, nowadays, especially in, the, in England, in the national health system, the whole system is completely demoralized. It is starved of funds, it is starved of uh, support structures. Uh, and that reflects partly in the care that we give to the patients, but also in the people that are working within the system. When you, when you come to work and you're already demoralized, you cannot give 
the best that you would wish to give to the patients, then eventually you almost give up. And that is what this island of uh, success, I think, that we created here is something that I feel is being one of my biggest achievements. I couldn't agree more with you. And I think I'm going to skip to one of the questions forward that I was going to ask you later, but I think it goes very well here. I asked some of my colleagues to don't, yesterday I think it was, I was going to come and talk to you. And they were, they were very excited and they told me that they saw the documentary, etc., on Netflix. And I, was, and I asked them, what, what made an impression on you from the documentary? And they told me, uh, I heard this a couple of times, his way with patients, the attitude, the way he communicated with patients. And that struck me because um, we, need, we need more role models like that. And we don't have that, sadly. And I'm, my question is, um, do you think this, this ethos of, this compassionate ethos, the, the ethos of the patient-centered care, do we have it in our healthcare system in the we UK? Don't. We don't. And actually, our healthcare system and the General Medical Council they want to create people that have no feelings because they need to create a perfect model that is always the same. We should not express our views. We should not play with the patients. It's too dangerous. In many respects, the patients become our enemies. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to be careful about how we communicate with people. And that has created a, a complete demoralization and the creation of a new type of a doctor, which is exactly the opposite of how I grew up in medicine. And how did I grow up in medicine? My father was a doctor, uh, one of the first doctors in, uh, in Cyprus, in, in, the, in the most poor part of uh, Cyprus, Paphos. And I remember he used to take me with him to the villages. And you arrive in the village and you have the men, of course, sitting, playing, back come on and uh, they sit there and they start complaining about back pains, uh, about um, that there was um, a bad crop that year. So I, I, I grew up to understand that the bad crop for that year, the economic hardship that people had goes together with a disease. And that created in me the concept of holistic medicine that a few decades later I was uh, hearing lectures about this concept. <laughs> what is holistic medicine? Holistic medicine is to arrive at the village and talk to somebody about their economic crisis and the problems that they are facing on a day-to-day -day life together with their, with their health issues. And I remember from my father how he used to interact with people. He would have a patient that would have uh, cancer, for example. So you tell them, look, I think you have a very serious problem. You're not going to live long. Go back to your village, sort out your affairs. And here is a bottle of wine to <laughs> celebrate life tonight. <laughs> tonight. And you would have given them really bad news. Yeah. And, and, and a few minutes later, they would be joking about it and they would be having, they would be having a laugh about it. Now, I grew up in that ethos. And a lot of the time in my interaction with the patients, I enjoy that concept where I try to understand who are they. I, I am like a hairdresser in the sense that you see somebody and you yeah. can either concentrate on how they, you should sort out their, their hair or during the process of cutting their hair, you also discuss with them and the enjoyment is not the cutting of the hair actually, it's the discussion that comes out of understanding somebody. The same in field of medicine, I do ultrasound scans, but in the vast majority of cases, the fetuses always look the same. In the vast majority of cases, you will give good, good, good news. In the few cases that you will give bad news, again, you need to understand whom are you giving the bad news to? Mm. What is the effect of the bad news on them, on their family, and in the long term, about their life as a whole? And you cannot do that unless you mess around the very things that the GMC does not want you to do, unless you play with them, unless you joke with them, unless you try to understand who they are. And not being a detached professional that sits behind the desk, always asks the same questions, being extremely careful not to display any feelings because you may be misunderstood by the way you responded to some 
responses from the, the patients. So in the earlier parts of my career, I, I had problems because in 99% of the cases, the, pe the persons would enjoy this type of style, mm -hmm. but a few maybe misunderstand it, and then they would be very angry with you. And that can create problems for you. But I felt always that the strength of my interaction was to be honest with the patients, to laugh with the patients, to, to feel really sad with the patients, to feel part of what you were telling them. And that is what came across in the film, that I cared about them because I do care about people. I cannot be a detached professional being afraid that if I show feelings, I may be misunderstood. If I am misunderstood, well, so be it. I think um, it's like you're taking the part, the human part of medicine out of medicine. And you're making something more artificial. Like uh, it's a diagnostic tree, you do this and this and this, well, probe and... But you know, unfortunately, <laughs> maybe I'm getting too old. Our whole society is becoming like this, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, in everything that we do nowadays, we have to be careful about how we interact with We're people. stepping on eggshells. I think that's a <clears throat> phrase that... Yeah. But it will come around. Do you think we could teach this ethos back in medical schools or in healthcare education? And if so, in what ways? I think that, um, yes, my, my, my father in the village with the peasants concept um, people try sometimes to, to give lectures about things, but then unless they see their teachers behaving in that way, you cannot teach people through a lecture on how to behave. And if the teachers have now learned that they must behave in a specific way, well, you are learning from them. But the whole school that I created, giving scholarships to people that come from all over the world, in each room, I have a senior that has been with me for about six months and a junior. And the junior is learning from the senior and the senior has learned from me on how to interact with people. And that, that is the way to teach people. Through experience. Through experience, through watching your peers, your, 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 your teachers working in that way. Is that how they do it? I mean, you, you are a medical student in the fourth year. What was your knowledge? How, how, what was your experience in, in watching your, your teachers? So it's a mixed experience. And I think the reason why it's mixed is there isn't a, there isn't a consensus on the ethos. Because some people have this. So you, you find some people that have this ethos. And you see them, and if you're smart enough, you follow them. And you, and you try and experience stuff with them so that can rub off because we're, we're, we're human beings that mimic each other. Yeah. Um, but sadly, it's not something that's promoted by the, by the organization, by the big organizations. It's not a, it's not a value that's um, when you do it, it's like you, you, you get a congratulations. You get a, you get a, someone says, hey, look at this guy. He did this and this. That was very nice. That was a good thing. And... Because that is not done, and that is, you also get, the majority of the people don't have this. So you have to go looking for it. So a woman turns up and you're about to do an ultrasound scan. They come in with an expectation that they will now see their baby. And you put the transducer on the abdomen and within a second, you know that the baby is dead. How, how, how do you break those news? What, 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 what do you tell people? You sit back. You say, I'm extremely sorry, but the scan has shown that your baby is not alive or the baby has died. This is an alternative strategy. You put your arm around her or you hold her hand or you touch her and you touch whatever part of her body happens to be in front of you. Yeah. It could be in the shoulder, it could be uh, an embracing or, or of the whole body it's touching the hand or if the leg is next to you, if she's lying there, you touch the leg. My God. If, and you don't need to say anything actually, in the vast majority of cases, you look in the eyes of somebody, you have touched them, you look at them and they know exactly what you're about to tell them. And that automatically shows that you're human and you care.
But imagine the one person in a hundred that will say, I went for a scan, the baby was dead, and he touched my leg. <laughs> and then you may call the police in for sexual abuse. Mm. And because these things occasionally happen, then everybody's scared. The, the mm. People are scared of touching each other, of interacting with each other in a way that I think is human. How do you navigate you this environment? If you're, what's your advice to junior doctors who, who see this ethos and they want to imitate it, but they feel scared? I, 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 I wouldn't want to uh, destroy them by, by, by telling them to imitate me, but I want them to continue to feel and they have to adjust in terms of their physical interactions. Mm -hmm. But, but it would be a very, very sad day when I would advocate to people to be detached professionals, show no feelings. Hello, your baby's dead. Nice to see you. Bye. Next one comes in. Good news, your baby's alive. Bye-bye. What? What, what, what? Is that what I want to see from a doctor? Mm. I am dying and I'm, I'm in my deathbed. What sort of a doctor do I want to be sitting next to me as I'm dying? Somebody who is sat in the corner, a great person with no feelings, that is very good professional, or somebody that will come near me and hold my hand. Yeah. And not say anything, actually. Just hold my hand. Well, this is the type of doctor that I want for me. I've talked to some doctors who are like this. One example is Dr. Nicolas Irodotu. He's a palliative care physician. I had a conversation with him. And he truly, like the stuff that he said and his way around patients as well, because I've seen him, he's, he teaches at UCL and he's what you explained as well. So I'm glad to say that we have the role models. It's just, my advice would be look out for them and, and go for it. Like go spend one week, two weeks with them. But yeah, what? I want the, a, a new generation of doctors to, uh, to be people with feelings that care about medicine. They care about the patients, yeah. Someone would say having feelings that might be getting invested in your patient's journey, that might, you might not have the mental capacity or, for example, in your line of job, um, when you, you see babies die in front of you on the yes. monitor in real time. Yes. I, I can imagine how, how devastating that must be. Yes. Like mentally, I, I don't know, how do you deal with it? Yeah. So first of all, I feel, I feel sad. I feel very depressed when I see that. I feel extremely stressed. And sometimes I will cry together with the patient. And I don't think that that is a sign of weakness. Quite the opposite, actually. So that is the human part. On, on the other side, when I see something going wrong during an intrauterine procedure, I have to be at the same time be thinking very quickly and, and, and build on my experience of the previous few decades of what are the next steps that may reverse the potential disaster. And in the Netflix movie, you're seeing that somebody comes in the room, yeah. you're, you're scanning them, you see that one baby's dead and the other baby's dying. And then, well, you just need to do something. And in some respects, what, what do I do? I tell her, listen to me, trust me, um, your baby's dying, I'm going to try and save this baby. No time to sit back and have a major discussion. Mm. The baby will be dead by the time you have these discussions. And they get on with it. So at that time, I'm thinking, what can I do to try and save this baby? But at the same time, I'm feeling terrible in, in, in sharing with the patient the anxiety. And what am I going to take her in five minutes if at the end the baby is dead? So I share in the feelings of the patients because I feel myself. I am not afraid to show my feelings. It's not a, it's not a, a point of weakness in, in sharing your feelings with, with a patient. Uh, but at the same time, as a, as a professional, you're trying to reverse a potential disaster. I think that might even make you a better doctor because you understand what the patient wants even better because you're sharing in a journey. This is my peasant father in the village that understands how within that village, within that family, an adverse event, an illness, can have a devastating effect for the whole life of the whole family, in terms of not only the illness and the death, but also the implications, the socioeconomic implications for the whole family. So 
this is what I learned and this is the type of medicine that I practice and this is the type of medicine that I enjoy practicing. And yeah. you care for the, this is what my father told me, uh, you care for the physical side of the being, you care for the mental side and then you care for the spiritual side because every, everyone has these three and you need to care for them. Part of it is understanding where they come from in order to be able to imitate that. So your father is a, is a very good doctor for me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you are as well. Um, I want to ask you what, what you mentioned the movie and then the part where you were taking those decisions under extreme stress and it's a situation where it's very hard to be in. What would make a good surgeon at that point? I think that, okay, you have to take decisions of, in, of how to intervene and try and reverse a potential mm -hmm. disaster. You're doing an operation and suddenly there's a hemorrhage. And you know from experience that unless you stop that hemorrhage, the baby, the fetus is going to die. So you need to act quickly on the basis of your exp previous experience to stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. uh, and to think ahead of, uh, of, of yourself, what happens when you stop the bleeding and you're seeing that the fetal heart is, is, is slowing down or is stopping. And then the next steps you have to actually take blood and do a blood transfusion in, in the baby. Where do you get those? Well, you don't invent them there and then. You have been through similar uh, circumstances before, and that's where the experience, uh, experience comes into it. Uh, we learn things, maybe not quite the same as that specific circumstance, but from other previous events where you have slowing of the heart and you need to give a blood transfusion and then the heart picks up, or a hemorrhage of how you try to stop the hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you're putting together your experience and the speed and somehow the patient is awake. They are watching and experiencing this potentially devastating effect. You just, again, you just need to look at them in the eye and tell them, trust me, let me try my best. You know that I'm trying my best. Mm -hmm. And then we can discuss afterwards what has happened. Yeah. I want to take us a bit back now. Yes. Um, yeah. What... Was there a specific moment that you thought that I, I want fetal medicine to be my devotion? I want this to be my life. So I am now studying uh, in, in, in England uh, at King's College as a, in medicine. And then suddenly the year is 1974, where we have the, uh, the, 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 the coup from the Greek military coup against Archbishop Makarios, my hero president. Uh, and then a week later, the invasion of Cyprus by Turkey, and then the destruction that, 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 that came with it. At that time, I became completely preoccupied by what had happened. My main preoccupation, my main, main interest was uh, politics. Because what was happening in Cyprus was also happening in Chile. A great, great doctor, a socialist doctor, mm -hmm. uh, Aliende, had won the elections, and then suddenly Pinochet and the military regime, encouraged by the same guy that destroyed Cyprus, Kissinger, the American foreign mm. minister, is encouraging the military to overthrow the regime in Latin America. And then we have the same thing happening in Greece. We have a dictatorship in Greece. We have a dictatorship in Turkey. We have a dictatorship in Spain, in Portugal, in Latin America, in, in, in South Africa, we have the the apartheid regime, mm -hmm. uh, where in England, the great uh, president, uh, Prime Minister Thatcher, was referring to Mandela as a terrorist. And their the ANC was a terrorist organizer. Don't, don't, don't think that by watching, by going to the House of Parliament and seeing the st statue of uh, Mandela, it has always been a great hero. For this government, for this country, he was a terrorist. And all of these things were happening in the 1970s. And I was studying medicine. I was not interested at all in medicine. I was only interested in all of these events. I was uh, a president of the Cypriot Students' Union, and we were collaborating with, with other uh, student unions, the Palestinians, the, the South, uh, South Africans, the Latin Americans. Uh, we were going to their meetings and we were coming to our meetings. So the years were going by, were going by and then I was coming towards the end of my studies. I was studying a little bit uh, at the end of each year so that I can just pass into the next year. 
And I was not really taken by, by medicine. I wasn't inspired by, uh, by medicine. Mm. There were so many other things that I was interested in. And then suddenly something happens. And one event, one lecture that can change your life. A, a very enthusiastic young professor arrives. He's giving his inaugural lecture. I am in the last year of the medical school. And he's talking about ultrasound. He brings this new technique. And he's talking about life before birth. And he's showing us images of the fetus. For me, until that time, life began when something comes out of the mother, quite a dark structure uh, that suddenly cries and from being dark becomes pink. And at that point, and you hear them crying, at that point, life begins. But then suddenly I see images of a human being before birth. And that makes me think life begins before birth. And one lecture creates so many questions in my mind that I say, that's what I want to become. I want to become a fetal doctor. One lecture. Mm. I qualify soon after that. And then I become obsessed with medicine because I was so very excited by this field. That's what I wanted to do. So running around political meetings, organizing demonstrations <laughs> in London, um, suddenly my obsession is medicine. Saturday, Sunday, instead of going around uh, to, to, to meet other people from other countries, becomes a preoccupation of me to understand how fetal life works. So here I am, a newly qualified doctor, very junior doctor, that I am doing research in fetal medicine and everything that I did was completely new. So within a very short period of time, a very junior doctor becomes one of the fathers of the new field of medicine. So I was very, very lucky. And from then on, it carried on like that for, the, for, 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 for decades until now. You've created many questions. But are you, <laughs> yes. um, so what, what is the point, really? You carry on. Yeah. My, doctor, my daughter is a medical student. And she carries on. She did law before. She did politics in the sense that she did a degree in uh, medical law and ethics, which mm -hmm. was very, very exciting. Yeah. And she arrives in the medical school. And then she looks at the various medical <laughs> students. And a lot of them look depressed, or they look <laughs> miserable, or they look uninterested in anything. Yeah. These are the people that have spent their previous three, four, five years doing physics, chemistry, biology. You're describing my life right now. <laughs> boring. I mean, I can't imagine anything more miserable than doing that. And then you arrive in the medical school, you're semi-frightened, and then you're having these lectures on anatomy and physiology and pharmacology, and, and, and they go home and they're studying all the time because there has been so much competition mm -hmm. into coming into medical school. And for somebody that has done something else like law or medical law and ethics, and they were forced to think they say, but what are these medical students thinking? So unless something dramatic happens to you, you just can carry on studying hard, passing the exams, finishing as a doctor, and then, okay, carrying on. Or something gets you excited. And yeah. that is the point at which you have something else. And it is not necessary for it to be medicine. Medicine for me, is unique because of the interaction with people, mm -hmm. life, death, and so on. But it could be law, it could be politics, something that excites you and makes you want to get out of bed in the morning and carry on working and interacting with people and being, enjoying what you're doing. What I'm getting from this is yes. one thing that we, because of COVID, we, yes. we, we've missed the human interaction especially medical students. And I felt this very much in my third and third and second year. And we come now to fourth year and we have lectures, but so many people are just not attending. And imagine that lecture, the one person, imagine if you did not attend that lecture. Yeah, I would have been another miserable doctor. It's, that it's amazing. When, and I did a, a few hours of work in any field that I was forced to specialize in and then continue to be interested in politics or art or something else. So it's so important yeah. to, to 
to experience, to go to the lectures, to go to the hospitals. Maybe you'll find a patient, that patient is going to, I've had patients that I've met and I've been like, like they've, I still remember their face and I still remember exactly what they said to me because they, they had such a big effect on me. And yeah. I felt uh, my daughter, I, I, I witnessed COVID in two ways. First of all, myself, mm -hmm. that I was always interacting with people. And I, I was going through a, a, an illness. And at that time, because of COVID, I was forced, they did not allow me to come and work in the hospital. So I was forced to stay at home. Mm -hmm. uh, and I w witnessed also COVID through my daughter. Here is a, an enthusiastic medical student that sits at home and listens to lectures. Often the lectures are not good. The slides are pretty awful. Uh, <laughs> sometimes you don't understand what they are saying. And this is your interaction with medicine for two years, sitting at home and listening to incomprehensible lectures. For me, it was three years. Well, you were very lucky. <laughs> but as you say, um, you know, we, in my generation, we learned medicine very much through interaction with patients. From the beginning, we were divided into firms and we had six or eight students in each firm. Mm -hmm. And what, what it meant is that in the morning you went and you clerked the patients, you were part of the ward, Raymond, you were looking after the patients during an operation and after the operation. And even now, 40 years later, I have the faces of people in, 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 in my eyes. I, I, I remember the first patient that I touched the abdomen and I felt a tumor. And I remember his face still now, and he had cancer of the stomach. He, he died a few months later, but I remember the disease through the feeling that I acquired by touching him and looking at his face. And that has remained with me. But if you take that away from people and you have lectures by bad lectures and bad slides, well, I feel sorry for that generation of, of students that did medicine like that. But don't worry, it's, it, it, you, it will, provided you are still remaining interested, yeah. you will, Catch up I with think that. If, yeah. you, if you love the human, if you love the human or the human condition, you will find your way through this. And one thing that I find remarkable about your story is that why, why did you like politics? Maybe this is my interpretation. I don't know if I'm going. Yes. Because people were suffering. People were suffering at that point. And then you go to your lecture and, you, and then you find out that humans, like they're inside us and those humans also suffer and they die. And I don't know. I think you have a love for the human and the human condition. But well, for me, politics and medicine are very much interrelated. And it is that thing that I learned in the village with my father, isn't it? That you cannot dissociate the disease. I am a doctor, history, special investigation, <laughs> differential diagnosis, and then prescription. Mm. Or you place this person within the context of their whole life, their whole society, and the implications that an illness has on their whole life. And that's where politics comes into it. And nowadays, of course, you are practicing medicine in England and you go somewhere and you're extremely frustrated because of the economic uh, hardships that the NHS is suffering, mm. you cannot practice medicine the way you would want to. So politics has a very important direct effect on how we practice medicine. I could not agree more with you. And that's yeah. why I'm... Politics is something that interests me as well, yeah. Yeah. I want to, I do have so many questions for you, but we don't have the time. Yeah. I want to go to one important one. How do you go about, I'm fascinated firstly by all the discoveries and like the fact that you're the father of this field, fetal medicine. I, I think I'm confident enough to call you that. Um, for example, the procedure with the 22 inch infusion syndrome, the procedure, the nuclear translucency uh, diagnosis, or the other procedure with the trachea, with the balloon for the, uh, for, for the lung herniation, how do you go about discovering a procedure or a test? How do you go about it? I was lucky. <laughs> I was lucky because I was in this new field and everything that we were observing was new. Yeah. So one day a patient comes when I was very much interested in understanding high drops fetalis, a very Greek word. Yeah. It means water locked. Um, and this woman had had many babies that had died from rhesus disease. The mother is rhesus negative, 
the father is positive, the fetus is positive, the mother develops antibodies, they destroy the baby's red cells, the babies become anemic and they die. Mm -hmm. But that usually happens at 16 weeks. Mm -hmm. And she had several babies that died and she came to me and I said, in the next pregnancy, I want to see you at 12 weeks. And she turns up at 12 weeks, and I look at the baby and it has a lot of fluid around the whole body. I said, it cannot be. Because I always believe that in these conditions, the babies die after 16 weeks and she's 12 weeks. Mm. Could, could, could it possibly be that I got it wrong in the previous years? At that time, I was doing a trial in women that were over the age of 35. I was trying two techniques, either amniocentesis or the new technique of chorionic villus sampling in women that were older and they were coming to have the test. I did the test and two days later, I had the results that this baby had Down syndrome. If I had done a scan and then I had waited for six months before the baby was born to find out, or most probably mm. before the baby died, that the baby had Downs, I would have missed the point. But somehow I see a lot of fluid behind the neck. I find it strange that there should be so much fluid at 12 weeks rather than 16 weeks. And then two days later, I have the results and they say, wow, could there be a connection between mm. the two? So that was luck. And a few days later, I saw another patient again, it had Downs. And then the next thing, of course, is that I had to study 100,000 pregnancies to develop the statistical model. And then I drove the hospital mad because I advertised this. And women were coming Saturday, Sunday, any time of the day, so that I could study 100,000 women yeah. to develop the statistical models. That was a new cultural translucency which is now the test that all pregnant women have in the 12 weeks. In terms of the twin to twin transfusion syndrome, we kept watching babies die. And at that time, I had a, a fellow from uh, France, which is the most important doctor now in France. And he appeared in the movie, uh, uh, Professor Yville. And we were watching these babies die and we said, but what can we do? They said, maybe we should cut the connecting blood vessels between them because the condition is a consequence of hemorrhage from one fetus into the other. But how are we going to do it? So he went around, he found the fetoscope, uh, found the laser machine, and we told this woman, your babies are dying. We haven't tried this before. Maybe we should try this. And at midnight one night, well, midnight, we, we tried, we didn't know whether it would work or not, but we tried. We had the faith of the patient, we had the idea, we had the enthusiasm, and it happened. Well, there's no chance that anything like this would happen now. <laughs> I was going to ask you. <laughs> it would take several months of going through ethics committees and so on. Yeah. I think it is right that we should have strict protocols and this should go through ethics committees. But at the same time, nowadays, there has been a lot of bureaucracy that at times it, it, it stops innovation. There needs to be a balance between these I, two. I think there must be a balance. Otherwise, you cannot have crazy doctors as they used to be referring to me because that's what they said to, mm. to this woman. It's a crazy guy, it's a crazy Cypriot in London and we will send it to him <laughs> and see what happens. And yeah. In terms of the diaphragmatic hernia, that was an evolution of techniques over a period of 40 years. Animal studies in the United States, mm. people trying to correct the problem. And then eventually uh, we got together with some doctors from uh, Belgium and from Spain. We had a patient from Cyprus that uh, had a baby that was dying with a diaphragmatic hernia. They said, well, let's try putting a balloon in the baby's trachea. And we did it. And the operation was successful, but the baby died because we did the operation too late at 34 weeks mm. when we knew from animal studies that we should have done it at 26 weeks. But because we did not know, we were not confident of how the operation would go, we did it late so that if things were to go wrong, we could at least quickly deliver the baby. But in doing so, we defeated the, the logic that we should do it at 26 yeah. weeks. And then we continued. This is the perseverance. We did that. And then we did a few more and things were working out. And then it took us 10 years to perfect the technique. And then another 10 years to do a randomized trial to prove that it was effective, so 20 years. 
So you've proven that these techniques, let's say you're at, you're at that point now. What do you do next? <laughs> <laughs> so yes. you have a technique that can help so many people around the world. Yeah. I think there's two pathways to go down to it. Yeah. But the, 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 the main thing that I'm worried about now is um, medical conditions in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And the most important ones really is preeclampsia, mm -hmm. the development of high blood pressure, which kills a lot of women throughout the world. Um, and I have been developing a model in the last 20 years of trying to identify women at 12 weeks that will subsequently develop preeclampsia. Mm -hmm. And then we did a trial. It was published in the best medical journal in the New England Journal of mm -hmm. Medicine in six years now. And we showed that by giving aspirin to women at high risk of preeclampsia that we identify at 12 weeks, we can dramatically reduce 90% reduction in the most severe types of preeclampsia. And the next step is clinical implementation. And then it's politics. Because a lot of your colleagues, a lot of the institutions, uh, out of jealousy, out of whatever other reason, they're putting a block to it. When we discovered the relationship between Downs and nuclear translucency, uh, and it became well known, and I did the 100,000 cases, and, 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 and we published that paper in the, in the Lancet, people were saying there is not enough evidence. And we provided the <laughs> most important evidence ever. And it took yes. 14 years between the discovery and the clinical implementation. And that frustrating 14 years was make, making me so angry at that time. Well, how soon would the method of implementing screening and prevention of preeclampsia be clinically implemented in England? I do not know. But it could take a lot of time. And I'm fighting political battles. That's where you need to be fighting yeah. for a change. I yeah. think, uh, one, I heard you say this once, you go to the big boss, and who's the boss? The people, you go to the women. Yes. And the women have supported you yes. along, and they've, they've been behind you. And your strategy of going around this was, I, it was fascinating. You went, women's magazines, you went yes. there to, to talk yeah. there, because you're talking to the customer, you're going to the person that has the problem that's going through the pain. And so the question I want to ask is, what can women do for this specific issue now? How can they fight for it and what can they do? So, so at, at one level, from the scientific point of view, you publish in the New England Journal of Medicine, you publish in The Lancet, and you think you prove the point, yeah. but actually you haven't. <laughs> the point will come from women themselves. And this is interesting, who are these women? Well, members of parliament, politicians, bankers, politically important and influential people happen to be in their reproductive years. So these people <laughs> become your greatest advocates. Yeah. And the women's magazines become a more important publication than the Lancet or the New England Journal because that's how you create the political pressure that will eventually see the implementation of things. Would you ask women to do something about the preeclampsia issue now? to raise awareness, would that help or? The Down syndrome was something that all women know irrespective of their education. They have heard about it, they understand it. Preeclampsia is something that unless their mother had it or their sister is not automatically known. What is it? We can we explain it in simple? Well, preeclampsia is the development suddenly during the course of pregnancy of high blood pressure mm -hmm. and proteinuria that can end up producing hemorrhages in the woman, it can produce death of the baby, it can produce strokes and heart attacks in the mother and the women can die. Um, but it's not something that is well known for the general population. But there's a lot of women that die from it every year. Yes, there are. Yes. Yeah. Many. Many women die throughout the world and many babies die throughout the world. Mm -hmm. There's 75,000 women that die uh, in, in the world from preeclampsia. There's more than half a million fetuses or babies that die as a result of preeclampsia. And how many of these are preventable by your estimation? I think that more than 90% are preventable. So, no further, there's more to be done. No further comment. From the film, we all know that you were diagnosed with the form of cancer. Yeah. And how is that going for you now? Because I've been asked this again by people. Yes. Um, and how are you dealing with it? How is it affecting you? And I also did hear that you don't, you don't want to retire, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm 69 now. Uh, in April, I will be, I will be 17. I still think that my brain is, 
is working. So I am potentially still safe. <laughs> <laughs> so unless they stop me from working because I have gone mad yeah. uh, or I'm too sick, I, will, I would want to continue to work until the end. When I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, the first thing I did is I, work, I went to the internet to find out that I will die within two years. Oh. And I called my friend, the professor of hematology, and he said, it's all rubbish keepers. Uh, come and see me tomorrow. <laughs> But that was the first time in my life that I realized that I'm vulnerable, that I can die. Until that time, I never thought of death, except on occasions where classmates of mine mm. uh, or friends or some relatives that I was growing up with were dying. And for a very short period of time, I would say, well, we will all die. But when it comes to you being told that you have an illness, and you read about it that you will die within two years, you say, my God, mm. now you realize that you are not immortal, as I previously thought. And then it's how you manage to cope with that. And then you put your, your faith in the, in the medical profession. Uh, I was lucky because I had a very good friend who was a professor of hematology. Um, and it was a relatively painless process of having chemotherapy and then, I mean, I, I was going to King's, I was having an, an infusion of, uh, of, of chemotherapy, and then I was coming back and continuing to work. And then I had a marrow transplantation. It was a bit difficult trying to recover from that, but um, it was in the, in the era of, uh, of COVID. Mm -hmm. The main problem for me was that I lost my hair. And we are all so vulnerable to our beauty. <laughs> At the time, to escape from COVID, I introduced a system that every Sunday, for one hour, we had Zoom meetings. There were more than 15,000 people joining from 170 countries. I was picking up my best friends uh, that were top doctors in our field for an hour on Sunday afternoon. And that became <laughs> an event for all of the people that were at home feeling miserable because of COVID. And then, and, and then I was thinking, oh my God, how am I going to face people now without any hair? And uh, after the first episode, then I just felt all right. So how is it going now? I had the chemotherapy. I went into remission. It's not a condition from which you are cured. Uh, you're having um, chemotherapy, uh, maintenance chemotherapy that I tolerate well. The only problem this year is that I have had a lot of uh, viral infections. So I mm. have been quite unwell for the last couple of months, which really angered me because I, again, I couldn't work as well as I would have liked to. So I'm in remission. And I know that at some point, and I don't really want to think about it, it will come back. And then I, again, place my faith in God and in the, in the medical profession. There are new drugs coming out. And I hope that when I come out of remission, then there will be new drugs that will keep me going for as long as possible. Until then, you would do the thing that you love. Of course. To the, the idea that I would stay at home and do what? Play golf? My God. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much for being here today. And um, I have a gift for you, just before we go. Uh, you might like this. <laughs> I have two gifts. So, do you drink tea? Of course I do. Yes. Of course you do. Thank so, you. this is... Whoops. Oh, okay. So, this is a tea. From, from Cyprus, from the monastery of Mesopotamos. Fantastic. It's, it's one Thank of my you. favorite teas. Yeah. Um, and now I have an announcement as well, because I don't know, the viewers don't know this. This is a book. It's called The Art and Science of Compassionate Care, A Practical Guide. We've just published it with Springer. It's gonna come out in the start of March. It's a multidisciplinary approach to compassion. Uh, and it's got, healthcare professionals from all different fields talking about the issue of compassion, the socio-economic issue of compassion, the issue of compassion in healthcare, in medical schools. And we're going to have a short series on this as well. That's going to be coming out soon. Uh, so I want to basically to give this to you because I know that from today, I realized that you, you, you're passionate about this. Well, uh, uh, first of all, it's a fantastic gift. But more importantly for me, the, the, the gift that comes out of this is you. Here you have somebody who's a medical student and understood these concepts and you're promoting them. And that gives me a lot of encouragement and faith 
in the profession that there are times I feel so demoralized by. So I congratulate you and, and, and I feel touched by the fact that you have written that and my congratulations. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for watching. <laughs>